Exodus chapter 33. What does the church say? Hosanna in the highest. Exodus chapter 33. And I'm reading in your hearing beginning in verse 18 and 19. And then we'll read chapter 34, verse 5 to 8. Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. Chapter 34. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquities, transgression, and sin, and yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Verse 8, Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and to worship. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord shall stand forever. Can the church say amen? amen? Father in heaven, speak to us now and show us your goodness. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. You may be seated. The title of our message today is The Goodness of the Lord. Can somebody turn to your neighbor and say the goodness of the Lord? And if you wish to give it an alternative title, you will say, show me your glory. And this is my prayer. This is our prayer today. Lord, show me your glory. But before we get into the message, beloved, I want to once again appreciate my preacher next to me. Somebody out there say amen. amen. I thank you. I'm not working alone here. I have someone next to me. But beloved, this church is an inclusive church. And we want to make sure that everyone that can be ministered to is ministered to. And in our presence, we have sinned because there are people who have often been deprived of the gospel. And today I speak specifically of those that are suffering or those that rather are living with autism, the condition called autism. And so I want us as a church to make sure that we repent of this sin because there are parents who no longer can worship because of the treatment of the church on their autistic children. And we are blind to those experiences. But today we say the temple is open for all. Somebody out there say amen. amen. And so, beloved, today I want to simply reflect on the goodness of the Lord, Exodus chapter 33 and Exodus chapter 34. The goodness of the Lord. Has God been good to you? God is good and all the time. God is excellent and God is good. The goodness of the Lord is seen here in the context of a man at prayer. This is a praying church. And I hope that as we continue in the series, you're going deeper and deeper in your prayer life. Somebody out there say amen. amen. That your commitment to prayer, your experience is prayer, in prayer is elevated to another level. Moses is praying. And this time as he prays, he is praying what we call intercessory prayer. 
And I want to invite the church today to a ministry of intercessory prayer. This means that when you pray, you are not praying for yourself alone. That as you approach the throne of God, your concern is not for yourself alone. As I stand before you, God has called me to a ministry of intercession. And when I get before the throne, I am learning and I have learned not to present myself and my needs, but also to present the needs of others. I may not know you by name, but as I pray, I am praying for you. And I pray that God will bless you in Jesus' name. I pray for you and I pray for your children. As you go to work, I'm praying that the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. For the sick, I pray that the Lord will heal you. But this time when Moses intercedes in prayer, he is interceding because of the sins of the people. His intercessory prayer and his mediation are in the context of a people that have sinned. And so Moses goes up the mountain and then he comes down the mountain. Like a messenger when I was in high school, sometimes you get a little shy when you have to approach a lady. Hello, somebody. <laughs> and then you have to find someone who can play a mediatory role for you. And you whisper in their ears, can you please go and say such and such <laughs> to so and so. And so the person goes as a messenger to deliver that message. And when they get there, they also have to receive a message that they will return with to you. And you are anxious when the message comes back. And you can see in the face whether you will be receiving glad tidings <laughs> or whether things are not quite in your favor today. And so Moses goes up the mountain with a message from the people. Are you still moving with me? When he gets to God, he delivers the message from the people. But then Moses also has to receive a message from God that he then also has to deliver to whom? To the people. Now this happens seven times. Seven times Moses goes up the mountain, delivers the message from the people. Seven times he returns back from the top of the mountain and delivers a message to the people. This seventh time, when Moses delivers the message, he delivers a message with three particular requests. And as I Go to this, I must mention that this was a priestly ministry that already was pre-empted through the life and ministry of Moses. A ministry that Christ himself would later come to fulfill. Now when Moses is doing this priestly ministry, um, my, my daughter came to me the other day and, uh, you know, she, she likes to share a joke or two, a riddle or two. And so she asked me and she asked the question, it says, why did the boy throw the butter out of the window? I scratched my head. I thought I was intelligent and, we and wise. Why did the boy throw the butter out of the window? I gave up and then I said, I, I, I have no idea. And then she said to me, it was to see the butterfly. And then the pastor in me said, I have one for you too. Why did the priest climb to the top of the mountain? She had no idea, and I said it was to become the high priest. <laughs> and so Moses goes up the mountain, as it were, to become the practical high priest. Hello, somebody. But three things Moses is asking for. Number one, Moses is asking for forgiveness. Number two, Moses is asking for divine presence. And number three, Moses is asking for divine glory. The first thing that he asks for is, Lord, forgive your people. The second thing that he asks for is, don't let us proceed without your presence. You remember that one. 
And the third one that he's asked for is, Lord, show me your glory. This is where I want us to pack the bus today. And I want you to pray the prayer, Lord, show me your glory. Show me, Lord, your glory. Beloved, this is the ultimate goal of prayer. In prayer, you ask for things that God will give you. And it could be anything, but in this instance, the thing that Moses is asking for is forgiveness. But allow me to say that the reason why God should give him forgiveness is not for forgiveness sake alone. Can the church say amen? The reason why he is asking for forgiveness is so that he can enjoy presence. Because sin separates us from the love of God. And so if sin is the obstacle, then Moses is asking that forgiveness be received so that presence may be enjoyed. Allow me to say, my brothers and sisters, whatever you ask for, let that thing, when it is given to you, bring you closer to the presence of God. The ultimate purpose of prayer, as we have seen, is not just to receive things, but to get into the presence of God. But when you enter the presence of God, what must you experience in His presence? Show me your glory. In His presence, our prayer is singular. Let us see the glory of Jehovah. This prayer was uttered again. This heart was reflected again in the king of Israel by the name of David. When David was caught by Nathan, remember when Nathan brought that uh, story to him, say there was a rich man who had so much uh, livestock and uh, he went with all that he had to steal from his neighbor that had little or none, very little, took everything. You remember that story? <laughs> and, the, and the prophet says, what should be done? And Mo, the, 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 the man of God, David, says, let him be stoned, let him be killed. And Nathan says, it is you. After receiving that word, David then wrote a psalm, Psalms chapter 51. And in the psalm he says, be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving. Do you have any sinners in the house? According to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. Is there anyone here that can join David in saying, I know my transgressions. I need no preacher to stand and tell, I know my transgressions. Again, and my sin is ever before me. Listen to David. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. And so you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. I like verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, however you desire truth in my innermost being and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Verse 7. Purify me. With hyssop, come on church, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear the joy, and hear joy and gladness, and let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. I like this, verse 11, and do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Can you see it there? And so the reason he is praying for the forgiveness of sins is so that he may receive and enjoy the continued presence of the Spirit of God. But ultimately, my brothers and sisters, why is he wanting to enjoy the presence of God? Psalms chapter 27 breaks it down for us. In Psalms 27, David prays and he says, one thing I ask for. This only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever, all the days of my life. Why? 
so that I may behold, come on church, so that I may gaze, so that I may see the beauty of the Lord. So why does David pray to be in the presence of the Lord? Why does David want to be in the temple of the Lord? It is so that he can behold and gaze and see the glory of Jehovah. Show me your glory. Now when David asks for this thing, show me your glory, he is praying for something that is already being enjoyed by others. You know some of the things that you are praying for, others are already enjoying them. In Revelation chapter 4, the Bible presents to us that there was a throne on the sea of glass. Am I still moving with the church? Can you see the throne? And the Bible says that there were four creatures around the throne. Beloved, what David is praying for and dreaming of is the life experience of the angels. When David says, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord, the angels dwell in the house of the Lord. When David says, I want to dwell there all the days of my life. Revelation 4 says, and they do not rest day or night. <laughs> so from the rising of the sun unto the setting of the same, those angels are in the presence of the Lord. When David prays and he says, I want to behold the beauty of the Lord, the angels Behold daily the beauty of the Lord. Catch this. Those four angels, not only do they behold the beauty of the Lord, but they have been made in order to be expert beholders. Expert witnesses. Hello, somebody. When you look and behold with two eyes, the Bible says those four creatures have eyes all over. They have eyes from the head to the toe. They have eyes on the left and on the right. So in terms of perspective, they are not lacking in perspective. They can behold the beauty of the Lord through this angle and that angle all at the same time. And so when David is saying, let me behold your beauty, these angels not only have eyes on the outside, but they also have eyes on the inside to behold the beauty of the Lord. Are you attuned to behold God's glory? The challenge that we have is not that God is glorious, but that we are blind. I want you to observe something. That in the same way that the angels are living the dream of David, some of you are living the dream that others are praying for. What you have learned to take as common, for somebody else, it is the object and subject of their prayer. That which has become, no, I, I met some folk from Cape Town, and I say to them, hey, you know what, you guys live in a marvelous place. I say to them that you live where we holiday. Ah. <laughs> I don't know if you've been to Cape Town, beloved. That place is gorgeous. As you're driving in, you look at the majesty of the mountain ranges. That place is heavenly. And yet one of them was a student and he says, Hey, pastor, you know the problem is when you live in a certain context for long, you get used to it. We are Traela. Hello, somebody. And in fact, he said to me, not only do we live where you holiday, we also stress where you distress. Your life, beloved, is filled, I will say this with greatest confidence, with evidences of the goodness of the Lord. God is good and all the time. I spoke to one of my elders and I asked him, how was your week? And he said to me, hey, you know, it was a difficult week. 
It was one of those weeks. But I will never forget what he said to me after saying all of that. He said, but I thank God for my problems. Because my problems are the desire that someone else has. Someone else wishes they could have my problem. You're not hearing what I'm saying. <laughs> A couple of days ago, I was praying for someone. We've been called to a ministry of prayer. But as I prayed for them, some of the things that they were asking for were things that I had access to. Please listen to the pastor. Proverbs chapter 3 says, Do not withhold good from the one whom you have the power to give it. And so I realized that why should I end with prayer? Let me do something more because it is in my power to do it. And so we went, and you know, for me, this was an ordinary exercise. The things I was getting were nothing big, but as I bought these things, as we bought these things and paid for them, when we got out of the shop, the gentleman said, you know, you've, you've done enough, Pastor. This is, this is, I'm really humbled by what you, and then he said to me, you don't need to take me to where I'm going. You just go your way. You've done enough. And then he got out of the car. And as he walks out, I'm driving off. And as I am driving out, I look out at the rearview mirror. And as I look at the rearview mirror, I can't believe my eyes. Because he's walking in the other direction with hands in the air, praising God. For me, I was simply getting ordinary things. But for him, this was an answer to prayer. I am saying to you, my brothers and sisters, do not despise the goodness of the Lord. Some of the things you prayed for, you are now looking at in your rearview mirror. Some of the things you yearn for, you are living in. When I was growing up, if you were like me, your mom and dad taught you good manners. And part of the teaching of good manners, when you're given something, they would teach you to say thank you. Now I like the way that my mom would do it. Because when somebody gives me something, she would say, and probably uh, my mom was also there in your own house because she would say to me, what do you say? Did your mom say that too? <laughs> what do you say? And I would respond and say, thank you. If somebody gave me something, she would then ask if I forget to say, what should you say? What you gonna say? And then I would say, thank you. My brothers and sisters, some of us, our praise, as we come into the temple, we need people to keep on asking, what should you say? We need people to keep on reminding, what do you say now? God's been good to you. And you need someone to drive you, to give the praise to God. He's answered your prayer, but you need someone to prod you and nudge you. Today I say, I will not let anyone encourage me. I will give him the praise. I woke up this morning. Thank you, Jesus. I have clothes on my back. Thank you, Jesus. When I got up this morning, I had food to eat. In fact, I could choose from the pantry. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I looked at my cupboard and I had selection of clothes. To thank you, Jesus. And then I got into the car and came to the temple, coming from my house when somebody else has no house. Thank you, Jesus. And so, my brothers and sisters, when we look back at what God has done, do not allow anybody else to give praise and your mouth remains silent. Here is the word that was spoken this morning. When the Israelites got to Babylon, they were confused. And they did not know how to, how shall we sing the songs of Zion? Help me somebody. How can we do that in a foreign land? How can I sing the songs of Zion in my situation? There are some of us that are blind to God's blessings. And we ask, how can I praise God today? But I like that after they say, we hung our harps and all of that. And then they said, but however, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. 
Let my hand lose its craftiness if I do not give him the praise. What were they saying? They were saying, if I don't learn to praise God, I might as well be dumb. Some of us must be made dumb here today until we learn to give praise to God. Zechariah was in the temple. And while he was in the temple, an angel who stands in the presence of God arrived dispatched with a command from heaven. And when he got into the temple, there was Zechariah who had been praying for a child and had no child with his wife. And then the angel says to him, do not be afraid. You are going to bear a son. You will call his name John. But this man of God serving as a priest in the house of God has a question. How will I know? To which Gabriel responds and says, I stand in the presence of God. I dwell. I am coming from the holy. I am coming from the throne room. I am coming from the state house of the universe. And you ask, how will you know? And the angel said, you will be dumb from henceforth. You will be able to utter no word. My brothers and sisters, some of us ought to become dumb until we learn to accept the word of God. And praise him for the thing. Come on, somebody. And praise him for what he has done. Instead of doubt, replace your doubt with praise and say, God is good. And he is good all the time. How is the evidence of God's goodness revealed? When Moses was praying for the glory of God, the response comes to him and says, I will allow my goodness to pass before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will be merciful to whom I will be merciful. Why was this grace needed? It was needed because the people had sinned. One of the reasons why we don't appreciate the goodness of God is because we are entitled. And we don't appreciate grace. I am alive this morning not because of my power, but because of grace. Heaven owes me nothing. Were I to be treated by the justice of God, I should be consumed. Were I to be treated by God's right justice, I should not be standing before you. I am amazed when I see pastors who think the church owes them something. I'm amazed when I see people who think God owes them something. If God owes us anything, the wages of sin is death. What we deserve is death. When you rise up in the morning, that's grace. When you walk from your house, that's grace. Anything that comes your way, learn to say thank you because it's an evidence of grace. I will make my grace to pass before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. Oh, beloved, some of us have not come face to face with the reality of our sins. I remember when I was in university, God allowed me to go through a struggle so that I will never judge anyone again. So that I will never sit on a high horse. He allowed me to struggle personally with sin. And I remember one night, as I was crying real tears, that I heard a song that said, Be still, my soul. The Lord is on your side. And from that moment, beloved, things changed that jig is into. Because no longer was I living on my righteousness. But I was living by the righteousness of Jehovah. I acknowledge, like David, that my righteousness is as filthy rags. What can I offer? All I can do is say, Lord, cover me with your righteousness. Come on, church. 
not only did he allow this struggle, but he allowed me to understand that in this life, you will always, unless you learn to appreciate grace, struggle with sin. Uh, I hope you can move with me. Unless you learn to appreciate grace, you will always struggle with sin. And today I have come to declare you are forgiven in Jesus' name. He is not there looking at you struggling. He is saying, my child, I am on your side. And when you can see his marvelous grace, then you will learn to get power over sin. The Israelites had two things that God was doing for them. In the Exodus, God was taking Israel out of Egypt. From, Gen from Exodus 1 to Exodus 19, God is taking Israel out of Egypt. But from chapter 19, God is taking Egypt out of Israel. Now we preach about the first portion. It is wonderful to see how God parts the sea. It's wonderful to see how God makes a way where there seems to be no way. Brings manna in the hunger. Brings water out of a rock. Wonderful are the workings of Jehovah. But the greatest struggle God had was not parting a sea. It was removing Egypt out of Israel. You see? You can be out of Egypt, but Egypt is still in you. Somebody said, I looked for the church, and I found it in the world. And then I looked for the world, and I found it in the church. Can I speak to the young people just for one second? You can be out of the club, but the club is still in you. Struggle with sin is a real thing when you're on your journey to the promised land. But as God deals with this most fundamental of problems, how will I deal with the sin of my people? They have just done a despicable thing. The answer to that is I will be gracious to them. As I look at you today, I know that I'm looking at Israelites that are modern Israelites who are struggling with things that you've picked up in the past. Hello, church. And it is not our duty as a church, as a people, to give you peace with your sin. Because sin and righteousness are slangani. It is not my job from the pulpit to say it is okay to keep on going I will be sinning against Jehovah. The sin you know is in your life. Confess it in Jesus' name. The sin that you know is in your life. Do not excuse it anymore. Do not redefine it anymore. Do not sugarcoat your situation. But say it plainly. Cleanse my heart, O God. I know that you're struggling with something, but the way out of it is not to overcome your sin, but it is to behold the glory of God. And so every day, God gave them symbols to understand how grace operates. Can the church say amen? What did he do? He said, my glory is not going to be revealed by way of the sapphire uh, flooring that Aaron, Adam, and Abihu, his sons, and the 70 elders saw. My glory is not going to be revealed by the gold and the silver that makes up the sanctuary, the curtains, the red and purple expensive cloth. My glory will not be revealed in all of these things, but my glory will be revealed through the grace that is self-sacrificial. And so how do we see God's glory in the temple? When a sinner had sinned, having sinned, they would take a lamb 
and they would go with that lamp to the sanctuary. My brothers and sisters, as they entered that sanctuary, this was not a walk of shame. This was a walk of faith. Can the church say amen? Why do we say it was an act of faith? This was an expression that God is gracious. And though I have sinned and deserved death, his grace is so large, his mercy is so real that he will stand in my place. The glory of God is revealed through the grace of Jesus. I want to say to you today that the grace of Jesus, that the mercy of God is the brightest expression of the goodness of Jehovah. And I pray that God will be good to you today. I pray that God will be merciful to you today. And I pray that you will learn to be grateful for the things that he has done. As we conclude, the ultimate expression, Moses was repositioned. If you want to see the glory of God, be ready for repositioning. He was taken from where he was and put in the cleft of the rock. The glory of God, when it comes your way, God prepares you by repositioning you. So do not pray for the glory of God to be revealed to you unless you are ready to be taken out of your comfort zone. The glory of God will need to take you from where you are to where God wants you to be so that you can be in the right position to see and behold his glory. And then when he has placed you there between a rock and a hard place, then his glory comes by. And my, watch him when the glory comes by. In the cleft of the rock, he is in the midst of darkness. My brothers and sisters, this darkness is the best place and the best vantage point by which you can see his glory revealed. It is in the darkest night that the brightest star shall shine. And I'm here to let you know that sometimes as God answers that prayer, there will be things that appear uncomfortable. There might be dark spaces that you enter in, but be ready. God will not leave you in the dark place. The glory is coming. I want you to pray a prayer. When you rise up in the morning, say, Lord, show me your glory. When you get into work, say, Lord, show me your glory. The problem is, when you get into situations, you're looking to how you will get out when God wants you to see how he can receive glory. This is why in John chapter 12, Jesus asks a question. And I will close with this one. Verse 27. Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me for this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Glorify your name. The glory comes in the darkest hour of Jesus. To understand this message, you ought to read it further up to verse 32. Jesus says, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he would die. Show me your glory. The glory of God is revealed through the self-sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. He died that you might live. And because he entered that dark cave in the cleft of that rock, the glory of God has forever been revealed. And it is my prayer that you will live your life as a witness daily to the goodness of Jehovah. May there be no tear that is wasted except as will reveal the glory of God. May there be no pain that comes your way except as will be an opportunity for the glory of God. And I know today that God will work many miracles in your lives. And this church will turn into a place of praise in the genuine sense, because we have all seen his glory. Amen.
Father, what more can we say? Indeed, all our lives, you have been faithful. All our lives, you have been good. And we join David in saying, Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And so, Father, we can only begin with Moses and saying, forgive us for we have sinned. We cannot lie. And so even I am grateful for your grace. Were it not for your mercy, we surely would have been consumed. But by your grace, we can be in your presence. Forgive us, Lord. But we thank you also, Lord, for giving us the assurance of your presence that you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. And so, Father, as we will be parting ways today, I ask that you may go with us, that no moment pass except as it is filled with the presence of the Spirit of God. Go with us to our homes. Go with us to our workplaces. Go with us to our friends. Go with us to every space. And may we not go where your presence does not desire for us to go. But Father, I also pray that you show us your glory. Show us your glory. Show us your goodness. Your people are praying, dear Lord. Your people are praying. And many have been praying for so long for things, praying for situations, praying for their families. But today, dear Lord, we are not only praying for those things, but we are asking through the answer to those prayers, glorify yourself. Be glorified. Show us your glory. Do miracles, Lord, among your people. Do things never seen before. Heal sicknesses that have never been healed. Prosper your people, not according to their acumen, but according to heaven's generosity. Show us your glory. May we not say it was by my might, it was by my wisdom. May your answers be greater than our abilities. Show us your glory. If there's somebody here today that is saying, Lord, I join David, I join Moses in confessing my sin. I do not need any preacher to remind me what my sin is. I know my sin and I confess it. To you I say God is good. God is gracious and his grace is greater than your sin. In Jesus' name, you're forgiven. There's somebody else that wants to experience the glory of God in your life. Show me your glory. You're done with the ordinary. And today you want to see the divine. Show me your glory. If there's somebody here like that, just raise your hand where you are. You say, Lord, show me your glory. 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 Hosanna in the highest. May the Lord's grace be bountiful to you. May his mercy operate in your life. And I pray from this day forth that the glory of God may be fully manifest in your space. When people look at you, may they see the workings of Jehovah. When your friends 
have been asking themselves, but does this one not believe in God? I pray today that from this day, that God will begin to show his glory in your life so that they may see what God is able to do. It's not about you anymore. It is about the glory of God. May he answer your prayer in Jesus' name. If you need a job and they've been making fun of you, today I pray that he will reveal his glory. When they're saying, but your business is not prospering, you keep on telling us to pray. You keep on telling us to come on Sabbath to worship. Where is your God? Show us, Lord, your glory. May people know that the God we serve is still a wonder-working God. May God show his power in your life. But then finally, there is someone here today that is saying, I want to walk with you. I have not been baptized. You may put your hands down. I have not been baptized and I want to be baptized. I want to give my life to Jesus so that I may live for the glory of God. As Mila sings, I want to invite you to come. Has been faithful to you. All my life you have been so, so good. God has really been good to you. With every breath that I am able, and I pray that with every breath I will see you will learn of the goodness to sing of his goodness. Of God. We want to celebrate you. I know there's someone, I know there's someone. Come, 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 come. Doors of grace are open. Come, come. All my come. life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing. I will sing. I invite the church into prayer. Of the goodness of God. While you're standing, pray in your heart. There's someone that needs to respond to the call of God your today. Your goodness is running up. And today's service is an expression of God's Your yearning for you. God is yearning for you. Come on, church, say amen. amen. Put your hands together. Put your hands together. You can do better than that. Put your hands together. Keep those hands rolling. Keep those hands rolling. God's been too good. And he's running after you today. He's coming and calling you. Come. Come. Oh, my brothers, keep your hands rolling. God bless you. God bless you. If you are like me, your sins need to be forgiven. It has been offered for free. Paid in full by the blood of Jesus. John stands and says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Don't go with your guilt today. His goodness is too much. You slept where you should not sleep, drank what you should not drink. I don't know what it is, but God is calling you now and saying, My child, come home. Come home. Come home. Come home. But it is not the pastor today. Please have it clear. It's God's appointment for you. I may leave this place and die on my way home. What will that be to you? But God everlasting is there. He will still, after I am gone, be calling you. It's not about us. We are here. We are gone. God is calling you. Come. Can you not think about God's goodness? Come on, church. Put your hands together. Hosanna in the highest if you could allow me. 
Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Is running after me. Oh yes. Running after me. Oh yes, oh yes. My life laid down. I surrender. The life. glory of the temple Give you is in the salvation of sinners. Angels long to look into these things. Running after me. What is happening today is a miracle. It is a divine transaction. Angels of God so good. are hovering over this place. In support of the plan to bring you back, to bring you back home. You've not been baptized. God's call today says, come. There's a young man. I know, I know it, I know it. There's a young man that needs to respond right now. There is a young man that needs to respond. Come on, church. Come on, put your hands together. A young lady. Your story changes today. Your story changes today. You will never be the same again. Never be the same again. We're not, we're, not, we're not dealing with ordinary things here today, my brothers and sisters. Heaven emptied itself for a plan executed to perfection through Jesus. Hosanna in the highest. Come on. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Oh, what pride. What pride. It's running after me. What pride. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. May the goodness of God follow you. Come on, church, say amen. There's somebody who is still in the valley of decision. May God's goodness pursue you until it wins you over. I see a father and a daughter here. Oh, Hosanna. 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 Elder Mbomvu. Elder Mbomvu. We are beginning a week of prayer tomorrow. Talking about the family of God. Somebody say amen. And what you're seeing here is children coming back to their house, coming back to their father, coming back home. And so as we begin, this is a wonderful way to begin the week of prayer, where we see God's children coming back into their father's house. And I want you to pray for them. And I want you to pray for all of us that we may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. One more time, please put your hands together for these. most gracious, loving Heavenly Father. We are grateful and thankful for your servant this afternoon. You have used him in a mighty and a powerful way to call us, dear Father, and give us an opportunity to come back into the fold. We thank you, God, for the powerful message that we have been given that your saving grace and your doors are still open. Oh, Tikoam, here are your children. We don't deserve to even mention your name. But Tiko, through your servant, they are here, they are saying, we want a new story to be written about our lives. Oh, Tiko, may you direct their feet Oh, Tiko, may you guide our hearts. May you give us love so that we can stretch our arms around them. 
Oh, Chico, may the crawl of grace protect them. We know Chico Wamindoba, as the preacher was preaching, there's a lot that the devil was implanting in their hearts. But they brave it, and we thank you, Father, to come in front and say, we declare our allegiance to you, O oh God. Let your goodness, let your mercy continue to guide us. We are starting a family week of prayer, dear Father. Let this church be that family that will nurture, that will embrace, that will help these new souls, dear Father, to grow. May you bless the preacher together with the faith family and you help us, help our pastor, dear Father, so that we may continue to teach and preach. Dear Father, I would like to pray for Sentin Church. We know that the devil continues to fight. We know, dear Father, the stories and everything that continues to happen. Let this place be a place of goodness and grace. Let this place be known for your love. Let this place be known for the spirit that continues to guide our decisions and our actions. Let the great controversy, dear Father, that place out there, let your victories be shown in how we live and how we embrace these new souls. In Jesus we pray. Amen.